And at this very moment, I cannot deny being thrilled at the idea that I'm in the, uh, the Ransom Center. And that even at a huge distance, my papers are rubbing shoulders with heroes of mine, Coleridge, who I, you know, is of all the 19th century writers, he's the one that I most identify with. Uh, not just his misuse of opium, but also his great walks and his fertile imagination and such like. And uh, William Blake, I've seen his archive here. T.H. White, the great natural history writer. So that thrills me, but I don't think of anything after death, I have to say. I can tell you exactly what thrills me about T.H. White is that, and this is perhaps an example of the ephemera, T.H. White, who wrote The Once and Future King, and he wrote also a great natural history book, The Goshawk and such like, he was a, a very um, sad, uh, easily depressed gay man um, from the 1930s, 40s and 50s, in a period when uh, you could be punished severely in the United Kingdom and, and, and imprisoned for leading a gay life. And you know, that's just appalling. And he internalised this in, in, in continual bouts of depression. However, as he explained in The Once and Future King, he said there's no reason to be sad and there's no reason to be depressed because, and I think he has Merlin say this, but it's really him saying it, because if you are depressed and you are feeling down in the mouth, then learn something. And he says, and I can't quote this exactly, once you've learned to parse medieval German verbs, you can learn to plough. And once you've mastered ploughing, you can set um, uh, your attentions towards knitting. And once you've learned to knit, um, you can discover how to make dough rise. And that was basically um, his method of dealing with this deep depression he had all of his life. Now, when I came here to the, uh, the, the centre, to the Ransom Centre, I asked to see T.H. Wyeth's uh, um, archive, expecting only notebooks and such like. And indeed, I found wonderful notebooks. But somebody told me, well, you should look at his paintings. And I didn't know that T.H. White did any paintings, so I said, oh, yeah, I'd love to see his paintings. And they got out the paintings. And there were a whole spread of really terrible paintings. But terrible paintings from every kind of style you can imagine from the 1920s. Um, there was surrealism. Uh, there was abstract, um, abstract realism. There was abstract expressionism. There was um, uh, fauvism. You know, just about every, there was watercolours, a representation of watercolours. Just about everything you can imagine T.H. White had had a go at and made a bad job of. But I was delighted that he, he wasn't any good at it because what this showed you was exactly what you'd read in the books, that, that at this period, on this particular day, he'd felt depressed and he thought, so now I'm going to do surrealism. And every one of these bad paintings was kind of uh, um, the interface between him and his depression. And that was immensely moving. More moving, maybe, than, um, than, than sitting down with a bland manus manuscript. You could see the guy trying and failing at art, but succeeding at dealing with his depression. And I have to say that when I saw that, knowing his background, because I'm deeply, deeply fond of poor old curmudgeonly T.H. White, there was a tear in my eye. So that, I think, begins to show how eloquent that archives can be. T.H. White has been dead for decades now. But that's an immense legacy that you can, that those terrible paintings that you did on the island of Alderney when you were depressed and bored one Wednesday afternoon in October 1953, say, can make a writer from the two generations later um, have wet eyes because they were so moving.